I should note that throughout this video, I'm going to use the term non-human animals to discuss species other than our own, since we ourselves are animals and common usage of the term doesn't tend to imply this. So, in the text, Singer's aim is to show that it's inconsistent to exclude non-human animals from being morally considerable under the principle of equality. He urges that we extend to other species the basic principle of equality that most of us recognise should be extended to all members of our own species. Singer makes three claims to combat speciesism. One, that equality is based on equal consideration. Two, that equality is a moral idea and not a factual one. And three, that the capacity for suffering is a prerequisite for rights. So, is it really that absurd to say that animals have rights? What Singer wants us to believe is that the issue of animal rights is an issue on the same level as the civil rights movements in the past, such as the African American rights movements, the women's rights movements, or the LGBT movements. What these have in common, along with other liberation movements of the past, is that they demand an expansion of our moral horizons and an extension or reinterpretation of the basic moral principle of equality. This is precisely what Singer hopes to accomplish by suggesting that these same rights be extended to non-human animals. As an analogy, Singer considers the criticism received by Mary Wollstonecraft following the publication of her foundational text a vindication of the rights of women. One such commenter, who we now know to be Thomas Taylor, anonymously published A Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, which essentially satirised Wollstonecraft by arguing that we should, using the same reasoning, extend rights to non-human animals. Taylor argues that 1. If Wollstonecraft's argument for women's rights is sound, then it is equally sound in regards to non-human animals, or brutes as he likes to call them. 2. Yet to hold that brutes have rights is manifestly absurd, Therefore, three, the reasoning by which Wollstonecraft's conclusion has been reached must be unsound. So we know that what Singer's going to say in response to this. He'll argue that no, the seeming absurdity of granting non-human animals rights is not a valid criticism of the concept. One might of course object to this, and say somewhat fairly that it would be absurd to grant equal rights to humans and other species, since it would then seem to imply that all of a sudden pigs have the rights to vote or to drive automobiles. Singer concedes with this objection, though only up to a point. Yes, it is true that there are important differences between humans and other species, and these differences warrant different rights, uh, just as the difference between men and women warrant different rights. We wouldn't offer abortion services to men, for example. This is because an equality of rights is not a sameness of rights. The basic principle of equality, Singer argues, is equality of consideration, and equal consideration for different beings may lead to different treatment and different rights. This is the first of his claims against speciesism. Singer's second claim is that equality is a moral ideal and not a factual one. If we are to base equality on the factual differences between humans and non-human animals, then it would seem as if every human has to be the same, which is obviously not true. Still, you could change the argument to say that humans are, on average, the same, uh, but if we do this, then it must be the case that all groups under the umbrella of humankind are factually the same which is itself a highly debated issue. This would mean that men and women are the same in all relevant respects, uh, as are many races. The problem with this is that even if it were true, it would allow for the possibility of discrimination if such differences were to emerge, and this could be then used to justify a hierarchical society. But equality does not depend on intelligence, moral capacity, physical strength, or other simple matters of fact. Equality is a moral ideal and not a simple assertion of fact. So if equality isn't based on the factual differences between human beings, then how can we say who gets it? Only beings that are morally considerable, Singer argues. Beings who have interests. And how can we tell which beings have interests? To answer this, Singer quotes Jeremy Bentham. The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? A stone, for instance, doesn't have interests, precisely due to its inability to suffer. Conversely, a mouse is an act of interest in not being harmed, as do all other creatures with a capacity of suffering. Therefore, it seems as if suffering is a prerequisite for having rights. The principle of equality which Singer cites is that each to count for one and none for more than one. As we've already discussed, this seems to be a more plausible basis for opposing racism and sexism, as it doesn't seem to rely on a factual equality of circumstances. We can use the same reasoning against speciesism. 
It is the fact that these isms unjustifiably give precedence to one group over others, which causes their violation of the principle of equality. They argue that there is a reason for members of their group to count for two rather than for one in Bentham's terms, uh, despite their equal moral standing. So, let's go over Singer's argument against speciesism. Premise 1. If beings are capable of suffering, then they have interests. Premise 2. Human beings and many non-human animals are capable of suffering. Conclusion 1. Therefore, human beings and many non-human animals have interests. Premise 3. According to the basic principle of equality, the interests of every being are to be taken into account and given equal weight. Premise 4. Human beings and many non-human animals have an interest in avoiding suffering. Conclusion 2. Therefore, the interests that non-human animals have in avoiding suffering ought to be given the same weight as the interests that human beings have in avoiding suffering. Failing to do this, as Singer points out, will result in speciesism. But what does this mean for the way that we act? Singer points out three areas of speciesism in human life which he thinks most need addressing. Number one is our consumption of other species for food. Number two is our use of non-human animals in vivisection. And number three, somewhat interestingly, is the treatment, or lack thereof, of non-human animals in contemporary philosophy. Starting with the first, Singer wants us to reconsider our position on consuming animal products. Other than the fact that we have no biological necessity to do so, Singer points out that more than just the act of killing, the process of rearing non-human animals for slaughter causes extreme suffering. It should also be noted that the production of non-human animal products, other than meat, such as dairy and eggs, also causes the suffering to occur. The interest we have in consuming animal products appears to be solely for its taste, which seems trivial in comparison to the interest that it conflicts with, to avoid suffering. To say otherwise would be to regard the trivial interests of one species over the fundamental interests of another, to be speciesist. To avoid speciesism, Singer implores us to stop this practice. More than that, he claims that each of us has a moral obligation to cease supporting this practice. Coming to the issue of vivisection, we might ask Singer whether or not he would object to our use of non-human animals in vivisection if it meant saving thousands of human lives. This, of course, assumes that all instances of vivisection occur under absolutist conditions, which they don't. Nonetheless, Singer would not object to this thought experiment. But perhaps a better question would be to ask the experimenter how they felt about substituting a child in the place of the animal. If they object where that did not before, then it is clear that they exhibit a bias towards their own species. To be consistent with their defence, Singer argues that the experimenter must be prepared to vivisect humans in the experiment, as well as non-human animals. The third issue which Singer discusses is the disregard of moral standing for non-human animals in contemporary philosophy. Singer sees this as a problem because it is considered to be the aim of philosophy for it to question the basic assumptions of our age, and by failing to address the issue of animal rights, philosophy seems to have become a practice of no more than sophisticated defence, rather than self-reflection. Singer is also clear that the problem is not that philosophers disagree with Singer's argument, but merely that they do not recognise animal rights as being an issue worth discussing in the first place. So in addition to some of the objections which we've already considered in our discussion, Singer considers the following from William Frankina, who argues that all men are to be treated as equals because they are human. They are human because they have emotions and desires, are able to think, and hence are capable of enjoying a good life in a sense in which other animals are not. In response to this, Singer asks Frankina to point out what the supposed capacity is, which is present in human, yet not in other species. Even supposing that non-human animals are unable to think, it is unclear how this restricts them from living the good life, as he says. Another possible objection, somewhat building upon Frankina's, suggests that for a being to have rights, they must have certain properties. For example, they must be autonomous or rational, a member of a community, or be able to respect the rights of others. Since non-human animals lack these properties, it is said that they lack these rights. Such properties, according to Singer, are little more than gobbledygook, utter nonsense. When faced with their potential moral equivalents with non-human animals, philosophers tend to waffle. They resort to high-sounding phrases like the intrinsic dignity of the human individual, as if we, humans, had some worth that other beings did not. Attempts at this, he says, are nothing more than attempts at creating excuses for a problem which these philosophers refuse to acknowledge. Furthermore to this, 
we might imagine cases in which humans do not possess these distinctly human capacities. For example, in the case of mental retardation or in infancy. In these cases, the capabilities of the human seem equal to or inferior to that of non-human animals. Yet still most philosophers will cling to the belief that there is something more which gives these marginal cases superiority. Singer, it seems to me, puts it right when he says that these fine phrases are the last resource of those who have run out of arguments. So in conclusion, Singer hopes to have convinced the reader to recognise and oppose their potential prejudice towards other species. This text was, and remains, deeply ingrained in the animal liberationist movement, and given the prominence and continual growth of animal rights today, it appears as if Singer was successful in raising awareness of this issue. Hey, so I just finished editing this video, and I thought I'd add this wee tidbit of information to wrap it all up. Uh, this video, along with other future philosophy-based videos that I'm planning to upload on this channel, is a bit of a thank you to the YouTube channels that regularly post educational videos on philosophy. You guys rock, and I honest to God owe you guys a lot of the grades that I got on my bachelor's degree for your efforts, so uh, hopefully this video can serve the same purpose. Um, in other news, I'm totally living it up here in Amsterdam. Who knew that moving to the other side of the world on a whim could turn out so wonderfully? Uh, the next video I'm planning to make on this channel will take a look at the film Stand By Me, uh, and its release will be completely determined by how much I procrastinate for my master's assignment, so uh, stay tuned.